Good morning and welcome to the monthly seminar of uh, COS. So it's the uh, first uh, seminar organized in October 2022. And we are very uh, honored and pleased to welcome the two distinguished professors from France, so uh, Santorini and Professor uh, Sorry, I, I don't remember. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we will give it to interesting talk today. And I, I do hope that uh, with the very beautiful beginning of this, uh, our Monday seminar will be gone very well so we go on this year and the years coming. So uh, maybe first I first mark the study with the talk first. So I let you introduce yourself for people here of course and for also people in the online. <laughs> okay, it's online. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, and uh, very happy uh, to, to be here. And actually, I, I'm also looking forward to hear more, uh, maybe uh, on your hands as well. Uh, uh, so, uh, what I'm going to present uh, is um, a bit of an overview of what we do in the team uh, at the Learning Planet Institute. Uh, Alexi visited actually uh, a few months back, uh, and uh, uh, these are topics that are related to participatory science, but topics related to how do you study that in a way quantitatively by uh, looking at it as uh, uh, data to better understand what are patterns of how it works well, uh, and how can you, um, what kind of tools you can use to model that, uh, and I'm going to show more tools related to network science. So I know here you're more specialized in agent-based modeling, uh, and I'm sure that there's also ways to better understand that what I'm going to say with, uh, with, with your tools. Uh, well, maybe uh, it's just to give an overview of, of the background uh, to uh, clarify where I come from. I'm a physicist originally, uh, and worked more with statistical physics. Uh, but I went uh, during my postdoc to network science, to study interactions between components and how it can lead to some collective behavior, uh, fragility of networks, or propagation of perturbation on networks. Uh, and my interest in networks is that it can bring a toolkit for very interdisciplinary approaches to biology, to medicine, to social science. You can describe many systems as interacting uh, uh, entities. And since I'm uh, uh, at the Learning Planet Institute, uh, I lead a team called the Interaction Data Lab. And we use the network science toolkits to understand uh, communities uh, in terms, especially scientific communities, how they organize, how, how they can scale, uh, how they can solve problems, how they can learn together. Uh, and so we mostly focus on uh, non institutional communities, so communities that are uh, typically open source communities, citizen science communities, open science communities, patient communities, uh, and communities where you have high turnover, you don't just potentially have horizontal governance, you don't necessarily have very institutional framework. And we try to understand in those settings what makes them sustain uh, uh, and uh, scale and uh, persist in time. And in particular, we have a focus uh, on communities that are involved in uh, proposing challenges and projects related to the sustainable development goals. Uh, in Europe, but not only, we work also uh, with the African partners on, on, on different grants. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk a bit also about some programs that we have run uh, on the platform that we designed for just one giant plan, where people can uh, propose uh, projects around SDGs uh, and find uh, volunteers to help them on the projects, specify needs they have, uh, and organize uh, and coordinate their action. Uh, and all that is. Uh, uh, in a way, for me, was intellectually stimulated by the reading of this book, which I highly recommend if you're interested in those topics from Michael Nielsen, called Reinventing Discovery, where he described attempts in mathematics uh, and uh, in, in astrophysics and in many different fields to uh, have large scale citizen science uh, possible. And so he explains what is this new era where science is very, very networked, where you have people in academia, but also a lot of people outside of academia. And he describes the fact that you need an architecture of attention. You need a way to be able to connect people because you cannot coordinate 10,000 people easily. So you need to create either tools or algorithms or methods 
in order to, to scale. And so you call that architecture of attention and you call that the design serendipity. Like hacked by design, you allow for the encounter, the random encounter between people uh, to solve problems. And so that's kind of a bit of the thread uh, of, of, this, uh, of this study. Uh, all right, so, well, the team, uh, so we've been a, a, a growing team, and right now there's a, a, a two postdocs in the team, a KZ student and research engineer. This is our Slack, so this is a bit kind of the core and periphery of the, of the collaboration network. And our, our main uh, approach is we have approaches that are based on data that exists, where we study data and we try to explain it using network approaches uh, and, and uh, using some methods that I want to explain. We have an experimental approach where we actually go and collect uh, data with self reports, for example, application to get data from the communities. We also have qualitative approach where we use interviews uh, and uh, uh, questionnaires to actually understand better, for example, patterns of innovation. And so we work for that with people that are specialists uh, in innovation studies. Uh, and so I'm gonna go now and uh, make uh, basically uh, show you a bit the five main areas that we cover uh, with this kind of, uh, of approach. So one first area that I'm interested in is when you have a network, uh, how can you, Propagate, how can you have contagion effects? So obviously, everyone knows about COVID, so you know about contagion. Uh, but we apply similar questions to uh, less traditional uh, data sets. For example, we've looked uh, at the propagation of uh, errors and of uh, failures, of uh, delays in that case, uh, in activity networks of large scale projects. For example, you need to do a bridge, you have thousands of activities to do to follow, right? And there can be a delay in one activity and this delay will propagate then in the nearby activity. And it will create a problem to actually complete uh, the project. And so typical methods here we look at is uh, modeling this perturbation spreading, understanding the cascades of delays. So what are the nodes that are critical, for example, and where you can have critical uh, cascades uh, that will uh, lower the performance of the project. So that's one example where we look more at socio-technical system. Uh, but then we looked also at this kind of uh, um, uh, approaches in the context of collaborative learning, where here the contagion process is the contagion of individual performance, of individual learning. And it's a collaboration we did with uh, Orange, uh, which is a phone company from France. Uh, and they have uh, done uh, um, a training in Madagascar where uh, you had 500 teachers uh, that were given telephones for one year uh, and in those telephones they could connect with tutors and with other uh, uh, participants in order to uh, learn uh, some grammar, French grammar, and then they had quizzes every day to test uh, their performance. And so from that we have a network of telephone interaction here, for example, which is a communication between the people. Uh, it was four villages, so here's the colors of the four villages. Uh, and uh, you see that people mostly interact within a village, but also a bit between villages. Uh, and so typically the uh, here methods that we uh, use, uh, we can see, for example, that uh, if uh, we have uh, assortativity, so if you have performance uh, at an individual has better performance, it will diffuse to the neighbor. So the uh, first graph on the left tells you that in the, the neighbors, the closer you are to somebody who performs, the more you also perform. So this just says that there is some kind of diffusion around a person on their performance. The graph in the middle is because we have temporal data, we can actually make what is called a regression discontinuity where we can test that there is a causality that if you interact with someone who did answer correctly before, then you have a higher probability to answer correctly. So we can actually use that data to make causal statements, which is nice in the in social context. But then we can also do uh, modeling of uh, the spreading uh, of uh, this performance across the network. And on the right is a model that we have uh, of propagation, uh, where we say, can we predict the performance of someone 
given the performance of all other people around and if we diffuse that in the network. So that allows us to understand better uh, just the process uh, of uh, the contagion process here of, uh, of, um, of the individual performance. Uh, so that's an example of application, for example, of models of diffusion and network, but in the context of, of learning. Uh, so that was that's more on dynamics. Then we have uh, approaches that are more on uh, structural properties of yeah. network, uh, looking at group performance, so not individual, but group. Uh, and one main model system that we use, and actually that's one of the reasons I'm going back to Paris uh, in two weeks, is called the iGEM competition. Uh, and the iGEM competition, it's, uh, it's, it's quite incredible. It was created 15 years ago. It's a competition where you have 300 teams every year that participate. <coughs> It's teams of students that are 10, 15 students. Uh, and for six months, they work on a project. The students design the project themselves. They get the help of PI. They collaborate with other teams. They, they collaborate locally with schools, with mayor, with cities, etc. And they create projects that are scientific projects where they do outreach, where they think about the ethics. Uh, and many of these projects led to startups or led to papers afterwards. And it's kind of a learning by doing that has really scaled and that is now a really big competition. Uh, and the thing is that what's interesting is it's an open science competition, meaning that the teams, they all have to write everything they do on an open lab notebook. So you have access to in time, which person did what and everything is documented. Mm -hmm. And because they used wikis, which is super cool for collaboration, we have the traces, exact traces of who did what at what time. So we know uh, which person did experimental part, which person did uh, a dry biology or bioinformatics, etc. And because we know who did what in where in the wiki, we can create uh, the division of labor of the team. So we can look at how people shared the tasks, how they collaborate among subset of tasks. Uh, so here tasks are in uh, red if they are collaborative, gray if they've been done by one person, and the blue uh, nodes are the persons that uh, the participants, like the team members. So this is one team here. And so we can reconstruct uh, team networks, but because we have 10 years of data, we can do that for 3,000 teams. So we have all the networks for the teams. We also know which teams collaborated with which other teams. So we also have the whole ecosystem of inter-team collaboration. Uh, and we also know the uh, success of the team, the performance. So that allows us to have a view of intra-team structure, how people divide the labor inside the team, inter-team structure, which is then how the teams collaborated with one another, and performance of each team. And so what we did, uh, and this is uh, a paper that we're submitting now, which is uh, we, we did a study on three aspects uh, in, in this data set. One is uh, looking at what are some universal patterns across all these teams of their work behavior. For example, we found that they all follow a deadline effect where uh, they work more and more as the deadline approaches as one over T. So it's known effect, it's exactly uh, 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 called the deadline pressure. And it was observed before for constraints, of, uh, for constraints submission that you have more and more as the deadline approach. So we see that they follow that. We also see that they divide their labor inequally. So there's people that work much more than others, but they all follow an exponential decay. So there's also something shared. But beyond the things that are shared, we look at what are things that promote better performance of the team. And so we find, obviously, that you want to have more people in your team to perform better, but it's not the only thing. It's saturated at some point. And so you also want to have uh, what we call intra-team integration. So you want to be able to have more shared tasks, so tasks that are shared by more team members. Uh, and you, have, you need to have low team constraints, so these uh, intra-team constraints here. Uh, inter-team constraints means that you have diverse collaborators. So teams that succeed well are teams that are able to connect to very uh, diverse other teams and gather uh, uh, more uh, 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 help, uh, diverse help. And finally, because teams can re-participate, 
we also have had the improving time. And so we see that the teams initially, they begin and they don't have a very good performance, but then after three participations, they have a better performance. So they improve and then it saturates. And we see that if uh, uh, you begin with a, a very low performance, like if you begin with no medal initially, it's actually very hard for you to, to, to get better. But if you begin with a gold medal, you get better and better. And so we, we find that also there is what we call a lock-in effect, that if initially you don't have a success, it's very, very hard as a team to get integrated in the ecosystem afterwards, etc. And so typically here, we make recommendation on the onboarding of novel teams in the ecosystem that you need to connect them to the core of the network. You need to help them connect to central teams, to teams that have a past success. And so we're looking at things like uh, now, we're making a paper on peer influence, uh, which is if you connect with another team that has had past success, it has the effect of yourself having had a past success. So there is an importance of connecting early on to the right uh, uh, nodes in the ecosystem. Uh, and so now we're kind of looking at that more at scale. So now this was scale of 15, 20 people, but we're also interested in uh, when you go now to 1,000 people. And for that, we're looking at open source ecosystem, which is uh, uh, typically uh, Linux and open source. Uh, uh, <laughs> Alexis, is that thing? <laughs> the, the what? Billion users. Ah, well, well, the billion users is because of uh, the smartphones, because of Android, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But uh, basically, it relies on things that are... <laughs> that's, that's true. That it's it's what, I, what I found on the, on the report, uh, but... Uh... Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, but... Ah, okay. <laughs> Uh, but you see here, it's a bit, uh, you see again, it's a temporal network. This is the same kind of network I've shown you before. It's people, the names here are people, and the structure is the file structure. And so you see that they're navigating, it's like a video game. They're going to different places and they're going and they're growing this tree of the project, right? And so what we're interested in is how they organize and especially how you kickstart that, but then how you maintain that and, and how does it survive? And how, how, how do you, uh, how much time do you need the core founders to be around, for example, et cetera. So that's something we're doing with um, uh, one of my uh, uh, postdocs. And we're looking, for example, here, these are three different open source projects. Each line is a person and each green dot is a moment that they're active. So first you have different dynamics. You have systems where everybody's working a bit uh, together. Some system when you have just one person, that really uh, push the project, but then you have people that just come episodically to make uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, contributions. <laughs> and yeah. What was your X and Y axis? X is time. So X is time. Uh, and Y is each time there is a new contributor, it's chronologically added. And it's basically the first contributor is this first line, then second is the second line, third, etc. So it gives you the rate of entry of new people, and it also shows you the uh, patterns. Uh, and what's your identity? More or less the same as the shape. Because it's sequential. It's sequential. So the main uh, interest we have in those is uh, we find kind of a bimodality where you have two types of people basically. And actually, this bimodality maybe I have here. The bimodality we observe is also shown when you look at inter event time, you have people that are uh, Poissonian and people that are Poorlo, meaning that there are people that are bursty. They come and when they come, they work for many days, but then they leave for two years and then they come back and they work for many days. And you have people that are Poissonian, they just come, do a few days and leave. Uh, yeah, and, and we, what we're most interested in is what we call the scaling transition, where uh, when we find big projects and we look at their contribution structures, so the number of contributions per person, if we rank the person by number of contribution, we find what is called a zip flow of exponent one. And what we find is that for all uh, re repositories <laughs> we've observed, as the repository scale, as it obtains more and more contributors on the right, as it scales above 100 contributors, it begins to have a contribution structure, which is a zip flow. 
And so we're trying to understand whether it's something that's necessary uh, in the repository level that once you scale, you have to basically create a community that has this fractal nature that is able to have locally people doing a few contribution on a subfolder, someone supervising that, etc. And so we're trying to find models of why we achieve this, uh, this very nice uh, deep flow. So basically to summarize, uh, these are things that now uh, I have an INEV in France to actually look at models of these processes. Uh, uh, so INEV is a French national uh, research grant. And we're trying to model things such as um, uh, bipartite network structures. So all the networks I've shown you, they have one part which is users and one part which is files. And so we're trying to get inspired from the uh, mutualistic networks in ecology, uh, where they describe things like nestedness or uh, some hierarchical nature of these networks to look at uh, whether these are models that can explain the network structure of self. We're also looking at uh, what is called um, uh, effective information. So whether the networks, when they get larger, they begin to showcase properties uh, where you can reduce the size of this network into a much smaller size without losing information. It's called, uh, it's a work by uh, uh, Brennan Klein and Eric Hull, where they showed that uh, in um, uh, some types of network, you can have, uh, when you reduce the size of the network, you can have higher what is called effective information than when it's full size. And it's what happens, for example, in an organism. It's better to describe you by saying you have lungs and you have, you know, uh, head and you have, uh, et cetera, than saying you have 10 billion cells. You need to reduce that to organs in order to have a better understanding of the system. So we're trying to look at how it's at play here also in these um, large scale networks. Uh, and yes, and we're also, uh, uh, doing some modeling on the dynamics and on the propagation of these networks. Uh, I don't know how much time I have left. Yeah, I have two minutes. So I will just uh, show you finally a few last things we do in the team as well. Uh, so as I told you, a lot of the data now I've shown you is data we collect, but we also have uh, tools where we can collect data from people. So for example, we developed an app so that we can get the collaboration network, self-reported collaboration network of people in time, where every week we ask them, who did you collaborate with? Who did you uh, 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 seek advice from, etc." And so we're doing that in iGEM teams, and we're also doing that in citizen science projects that we're uh, uh, doing now. Uh, and we're also doing visualization tools for larger networks that we have uh, in order to also help people do exploration of, uh, of the networks, because some networks we have are temporal, they're very big, and you can have an idea beforehand of what to look for, but sometimes it's nice to visualize, and you know, as you do here with VR, uh, to actually help people play uh, and select the communities. Uh, this is actually a tool that Leo, we talked to you about Leo Blondel as a person who knows VR, so he developed this technology in the lab, and he developed it in 3D so that it can also be uh, in VR. You can explore the network and you can paint with your uh, uh, little uh, handle. And so this is just an example of the kind of technologies that also we're interested in, which is how can you help uh, enter these complex objects, basically. Uh, what, uh, yeah, I can talk also a bit about that, that because this one is the work we're doing with Yuba. So what I've shown you is structures of network and how people collaborate, but we're also interested in general in the innovation, how people do new things. Uh, and because we're in the Center for Interdisciplinary and we, uh, we tend to like interdisciplinarity, we wanted to understand how interdisciplinarity is important also for innovation. And so we did work with Yuba and with our postdoc, Shakresh, who got married in India, by the way, so he's the one who got married. And that's why you have Indian snacks. <laughs> Uh, we also do work that is called science of science, where we look at uh, evolution of scientific fields and who are the people that are acting and studying very early in the innovation uh, of a field. And we study archive, which maybe all you know, archive is a, a repository where you can publish a preprint, you can publish an article before it's, it's accepted by a journal. Uh, and it's nice because it's, we can access the data on, on uh, the papers, uh, there's 1.5 million papers we have from there, but we know the fields of the papers. So here, 
it's all the fields. So you have uh, uh, physics here, you have uh, computer science here, mathematics, and you have uh, finance and uh, uh, quantitative biology. So you have these fields uh, uh, that are on archive. And what we looked is um, we found that all fields they actually follow uh, rise and fall, uh, uh, birth and death of the field, that we found a way to renormalize based on the um, right skewed distribution called uh, the Gumball distribution. So it's uh, like a viable, it's like an aging type of distribution. And that allowed us for each of these fields to see who are the early adopters, the innovators, who are the ones that come after that at the peak, and who are the ones that are very late and they're just here to implement, uh, exploit the results and do very more precise work. And then we analyzed the fact that early in the field, in this very early stage, you tend to have people that are playing with very cognitively distant um, uh, fields. So they tend to combine very interdisciplinary work. They tend to be also younger, uh, early career, and they have more uh, papers in, in, the, in the long run. And then when you're late in the field, it's uh, you're more like monodisciplinary. So we began to look at that, and now we're doing uh, um, another paper also, and, and I don't know Lyubov if you talk about that, but because we were working at, and Lyubov will show more results that she's done on a random walk theory uh, and how people, uh, what is mobility of people, we looked at mobility in knowledge space. So from all these fields, we could make a representation called an embedding, which is a low dimensional representation uh, a 2D representation of uh, the knowledge space. So here, each point, in a way, represents a combination of fields. It represents, for example, here, I don't know, like it would be maybe a, a, a quantum physics, and here maybe it would be, I don't know, a, a algebra, right? And so then you can see each, each trajectory is one person, and they move as they publish articles. You can see they move around, they choose new topics, they make big jumps, or they stay around. So that allows to have concepts of locality or big jumps and to understand what happens when you make a jump. And so we found first that people indeed have a bimodal behavior. So that's either they wander locally or they make big jumps and they go somewhere else. But we were also able to apply what is called gravity models uh, to show that there's a very good description of this movement based on similar models that exist in, mobility, in human mobility in space, which is that people they will go to a place that has high density, but as a function of one over the distance with an exponent that is very close to one, actually. So it's very similar to uh, what is known in human mobility. Uh, and so we're looking at now if we can find types of people, for example, that is lead to more innovative behavior. And so that gives more a way to represent virtual mobility in a way uh, and, and work with that. Uh, and I finish here just to say that all that is more analysis. But we also have a thread which is more about implementing uh, scientific programs, and that's actually uh, very much what, what Lubov is working on the also uh, here, uh, uh, what you're doing with the grants in a way, which is uh, doing uh, open uh, uh, programs. Uh, and so I think you will talk maybe about, uh, about that, right? Uh, and so we've been interested to do that with uh, uh, just one giant lab, so this uh, platform uh, for uh, doing open science projects. Uh, and here I will just show that, uh, so for one example of the program we had was during COVID, we had around 4,000 people coming to contribute on projects. Uh, and uh, this is the activity in time. So you see there was a big peak in March, 2020. And uh, we could, uh, first we could understand the community structure because we had access to the, to the data on how people interact together. So we could see where was the need for coordinating different subgroups, uh, which were more isolated people or people that needed to be introduced to other projects. Uh, and we also ran a, a little um, uh, 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 micro grant uh, 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 um, We run a micro grant uh, uh, um, program in order uh, to uh, select projects across all the projects proposed, select projects that could have a little money to continue. It was like 3,000 euros. And the community itself was the one selecting those projects. So it was a community review process uh, that, we, that we did for that. Uh, and we also 
implemented a recommender system in the platform to help uh, people connect needs that they had uh, to other users that could answer uh, those needs. So it was a very simple recommender system where we would connect people based on needs, sharing similar skills, and that were connected to similar projects that are of their interest. Uh, and we showed that indeed people would click more these needs compared to other needs on the platform. So we're also trying to basically animate and engage more the community on the, on the platform with, with these tools. Uh, and so, yeah, so maybe to conclude, because I see time. Uh, so just to conclude, so we use digital traces, but also data we collect to understand community organization, so the structure, also uh, 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 dynamics, so how, how it evolves and how there can be propagation of uh, uh, learning of performance and uh, to understand the performance of these uh, uh, structures. Uh, and yeah, so basically we show here more network approach to uh, model uh, these communities because they are virtual. Uh, I'm sure there also can be uh, things to do with atom based modeling, but I don't know uh, very much. Uh, uh, I haven't touched that very much. Uh, and uh, so that's it uh, on my end. So thank you. And, uh, okay. And so we have time to have questions. Are there any questions, comments? Just a yes. question about your work. Yeah. You are not taking into account the characteristics of people. So just because. Ah, uh, yes. For okay. For the, for the orange? Running, yeah. Yeah. Some, some kind of some skills. So in the, in the orange, for example? So this one is very nice because we actually have yeah. a lot of confounders. So we have uh, the level uh, of uh, education of the person, we have the seniority, we have the gender, we have uh, the location uh, also, uh, we have the literacy, uh, technological literacy. So they actually collected a lot of confounders that we use uh, when we do model uh, the, the, the modeling. Uh, and we also actually, this one, so I showed just assortativity uh, here in terms of, uh, uh, oops, I just showed assortativity in terms of performance but we also have assortativity in terms of other variables. For example, you tend to be uh, connecting with people that are of your age level or of your gender, et cetera. And so you can, you can correct for that in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the model. So we do have that for this one. For, uh, and for iGEM, what we have is that we have in the team, we know if, the, if it is PI, tutors, uh, students or team leader in the students, so we have some also knowledge about attributes of the nodes. Uh, what we try to do now on, on IGEM especially is we have a page for each team where it's unstructured text, but they tell us what is their background, uh, what is the field that they have done before, and so we can have almost proxies about what are their skills. But now we're doing, we're doing, uh, we're collecting data with an uh, with a survey from them where they actually declare exactly the, the skills they have, et cetera. So we're trying to, to get more of that, yes. Okay. Uh, about the, still the iGEM yeah. competition. So you said uh, like the teams that were, say the worst, they gain by cooperating with the best. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so does that effect last after they cooperate? Or mm. ah, that's a good is it question. some kind of bootstrap? Ah, that's a good question. Uh, right now, that's true that we, so what we have, uh, what we know is that, uh, so now what we know in terms of long-term effect is that if you begin, so gray line is that you begin with no medal. And for example, here the y-axis is uh, how many collaborators you're able to gain in the ecosystem. And we know that you're basically not able to after in your re-participation, you're not able to integrate the ecosystem, but if you begin with a gold medal, you're getting more and more in integrated. So that's what we know. Second things we know indeed is that if one year you collaborate um, with uh, a team that uh, indeed has, has past success, it will make you have a, a better chance of success than if you didn't. Uh, and it's half of the effect of having yourself a past success. But we didn't look uh, at this subset of team what happens, uh, how long does it uh, actually last? But it's a very good question, actually. 
it's a very good, like the memory of uh, yeah. your interaction. The, the only thing that is a bit difficult, so we worked for this peer influence. We worked uh, actually with um, specialists of causal modeling because the difficult thing is that you need to actually compare. What you need to do is what is called a quasi experiment. So the thing is that because teams that are successful in the past, they have a high chance to attract many collaborators, it's very probable that you interact with such a team yeah. because it's a hub. And so what you need to do is compare that uh, with um, uh, a kind of randomized network. Like what would be the chance that you indeed connect uh, in a random network to such a team? And so we, we need, need to do a quasi experiment. So I need to see how that would play for afterwards, uh, because then you need to see afterwards if you, yeah, we, we could just see if you keep being integrated and, and collaborating with such teams, for example, and so on. So that's a very good question. We didn't do this analysis. Thank you. Are there any questions? And maybe online, you have any questions? Yeah, I have questions. Yeah, but yes. uh, I can, uh, yeah. what are the kind of projects? That are yes, very good. Yeah. So actually, so um, in iGEM, so initially, it's a, it's the, the initial idea of iGEM is a synthetic biology competition. So synthetic biology, they need to, uh, for example, you have a bacteria and you try to change this bacteria to change the genetic uh, material in order to do something new, to make a rice that grows better or to, uh, so it's synthetic biology. And it was born around the time of uh, the, when synthetic biology was born. And the idea was the following, is that uh, in uh, synthetic biology, what they need to do is what is called biobricks. Biobricks are kind of Lego bricks of DNA that you can combine together to make a function. But the thing is that these biobricks, uh, it's, it's not known the space of all possible combinations. And so when biology, synthetic biology was born, they were like, well, not only it's not known what is the space of combination, but it's also not known how dangerous it can be, and people need to be educated on that. And so they decided to create the competition to explore all the possible combinations of biobricks. It's like a crowdsourcing, like each team explores one combination, uh, but also each team has to explain the ethics and how they make safety. So they learn uh, how to, what is the good practices, and it's part of the judging is not only were they able to do a combination of, of biological components, but also were they able to think about the safety and to also do outreach to explain that to people around. So it's kind of learning by research, but also kind of uh, learning uh, to be careful with, uh, with synthetic biology. And so now they have tracks, uh, many tracks. So they have tracks also of teams that just do software, teams that just do uh, more like hardware, a 3D printing, for example, uh, uh, cells are, so, so they have uh, uh, different tracks, but it's all centered more like around uh, synthetic biology. So there, there, those are different projects, but they are kind of homogeneous in terms of uh, yeah. tools and uh, yeah, so the, the, the criteria for the medal are very strict. So they have a criteria to have, to have bronze, silver, gold medal. How, how do, you, do you define a success? Yeah, so success here is you have uh, two criteria. You have uh, medals, which I, I showed here, which is a cumulative success. So to have a bronze medal, you need certain criteria. Silver medal, you need to have the criteria for the bronze medal plus silver. And gold medal, you need to have more criteria. So it's, it's uh, criteria for the medals. And you also have a prizes, which is awards of what is the best in a given category. And these are specific categories. It can be uh, best, for example, uh, best uh, original combination of biobricks, for example. And, and so these are, uh, and these are based on judges. So there are six judges per team. And uh, now we're actually working with the headquarters because we have access to the exact notes of the judges uh, on this criteria. So you can. They also evaluate things like how creative was the team, et cetera, et cetera. So right now, we just use the medals uh, that I showed here. OK, so the last question, uh, Sharon. Can you say how do you find this competition? Huh? How do you found? Like, how do you found it? Yeah. Yeah, very good. <laughs> it's, so the iGEM is a, it's a foundation now. Their business model is basically that teams have to pay to participate to this event mm -hmm. that is called the Jamboree. So it happens in two weeks in Paris now, but it was in Boston before. So they have to pay to participate. I think they have to pay 15,000 uh, for the team. 
and plus 4,000 per person that goes to the competition. Mm -hmm. And so that's the main way they make uh, money uh, is basically teams apply and pay to participate. So they have students. So the, the, it's like a marathon. They ask for, for um, uh, money as well. So the team is responsible to get money from uh, either university, either private companies that help them. And usually they are able to make around 40, 50,000 okay. from donation. From, and and, no scholarships? So, so there are, so some students are, have scholarships to so count it as an internship for most students. And so, and so it, it's really similar to a marathon that they're able to find specific money for that and countries have been investing also to have representation in this competition. And so now what they have is that they have ambassadors that go to Africa, South America, uh, and places where they could have less funding to help them actually connect uh, with uh, uh, funding to promote uh, teams locally. It's a very good system to look here. Yeah. So thank you very much. I think that uh, we have more questions and comments. We have uh, some in the networking uh, phase. So I think uh, we can stop here for the second speaker. So uh, again, uh, thanks so much for the speaker.